as I mentioned when we were doing the praise and worship time, typically, traditionally, the Sunday before Thanksgiving ends up being when we do the Thanksgiving sermon. We pastors have been so conditioned. It's, it's amazing. Like next week is Christmas, starts Christmas season. And so I've, you know, I've got to preach a Christmas sermon for the next four weeks. If I don't do it, don't look badly at me. I kind of go with what the Lord says. Last week, I, he wanted me to be in Galatians 6, 7 through 9 again, as I shared with you who were here last week. So it's like, thank you, Lord. And, and I thought, so I guess I'm off the hook for Thanksgiving. Not so fast. You'll notice on that song sheet that I gave you, there's one more song. And it's a song we've sung again and again and again and again over the years, Forever, by Chris Tomlin. Of course, Chris Tomlin always writes his music based on something out of Scripture. That's why we like Chris Tomlin. And the phrase, I wasn't even thinking about the song. I'd already given Catherine and Kurt the songs we were going to do for this week, and it was not included in the song list. But as I was reading my, my, my Bible the other day, and by the way, I was in Colossians. This, this line kept coming through my head. Give thanks to the Lord our God, for He is good. His love endures forever. And I couldn't get away from it. And it wasn't Chris Tomlin. It wasn't his voice in my head. It was, it was, it was, it was the Bible, not Chris Tomlin. So I was like, all right, well, what do you want me to do with that? And he reminded me of a study that I did a long, long time ago that's included in, in, in these verses. Um, though, I'll give you more information about that in a few minutes. But he just really focused me in on the idea of why am I thankful? Why? Why am I thankful? And you guys, we started going around the room, and I've done this at church services before around Thanksgiving, you know, somebody share why you're thankful. And, and people, some people are willing to not be so churchy because some people go, oh, I'm thankful for my pastor and my church, you know, and it's like, just stop it, you know, just stop that. You know, I'm glad that you are, but, you know, we're in church. Talk to me about something else, you know. People say, I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful for my job. I'm thankful for my home. I'm, I'm thankful. And, and, and you know, I, I, I remember we used to have a youth pastor. And he had um, allergies and asthma. And Ben's a big guy. I mean, Ben's like 6'4". He's this big, strapping guy. But uh, bad air can bring him to his knees. And I remember we were, we were sitting there in a service, and, and this is, God, day, almost 25 years ago. And Ben said, I'm thankful to be able to breathe. And I thought, that's getting it there. That's getting it down to where we need to be, right? Because I think we look past a lot of that stuff. Like, thank you, Lord, that there's blood running through my veins today. That's a good thing, right? Because if it's not, you're in trouble. Why are we thankful? And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose the third day and that He gave me an avenue to have a relationship with Him and with God the Father. I'm thankful for that. We wouldn't be here otherwise today. But I'm going to take you to a little more fundamental foundational idea today we're going to be in the 107th psalm psalm 107 and i'm just really going to look at one verse and me and the lord went ran around about this i kept trying to help him out on this and he kept saying just keep it simple son it's really going to work better today and i was like all right lord it's cool it's good and if god with his brilliance and god with his power and god with his knowledge says keep it simple Let's keep it simple, right? All right, amen. So don't go to sleep on me today. This is good stuff. It's simple, but it's not easy always. Here's what the psalmist writes. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. There it is, right? I had that in my head the other day. Now, here's the thing. I could have picked any number of verses that say this. If you go do a search in a, word, in a, um, a Bible software and you just put in, give thanks to the Lord. There's a whole lot of verses that come up. And there's a number of them that say literally this exact same thing. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. First Chronicles 16. Anybody know why somebody would be saying that in First Chronicles 16? When's the last time you hung out in First Chronicles 16? That's when the Israelites were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem after it had been captured by the Philistines. And King David, which we did a sermon back in, I don't know, earlier this year, February, I think, about that, 
uh, that event. So we're not going there again today. But um, part of David's song to God as they brought the ark back was, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. There's also several Psalms, not just 107, but 106, 118, and 136. And the last two actually have it twice in those Psalms. And so it's in a lot of different places. And so um, you can look what comes behind those verses and you can see these psalmists, don't be insulted by the phrase I'm going to use here, bragging on God. We can brag on God, guys. Matter of fact, we should. We should brag on our God. But I want you to grab three ideas out of this verse. Very simply. Number one, we give thanks to the... Who do we give thanks to? Who? The The Lord. If you look in your Bible, and guys, some of this is going to be reruns, but I think the thing I've learned in ministry is about the time you get tired of saying it, people start hearing you, right? I mean, that, that, that's honestly the truth. And you've discovered that. If you've had children, you know what I'm talking about. About the time you get tired of telling them, they finally start to hear you. All right? So don't feel like this is being insulting to you if you say, Pastor, this has got to be the 19th time you've said this. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Anybody know what that's our English translation for? Yahweh. Yahweh God. Y-H-W-H, the, the 25 cent theological phrase is the tetragrammaton. You will not be quizzed on this. But taking notes will be a good thing, as I said last week. Y-H-W-H. The Hebrew in its original form didn't have vowels. It didn't have the pointers that it's got on there. Jesus talks about not one jot or one tittle. Those are the little dots and dashes and stuff that are all around. All the Hebrews had were their letters. Their 22 odd letters. I think it's 22, just like the Hawaiians. Their 22 letters. They didn't have all the dots and dashes. And so, so scholars sometimes weren't sure what to put between them to make the sound. And Yahweh is that. Because the Jewish people wouldn't pronounce the name Yahweh. Even today, if you read a website, if you go on a website that's written by a Jewish person, they will write G-D. They won't write God. G-D. And in the same way, they will not pronounce the name that is unpronounceable. We say Yahweh. You may know it as another name, Jehovah. That's kind of a German way of saying that. But they didn't know what the vowels were between that. And it's still up for debate. But Y-H-W-H. Every time you see in the Bible... All capital letters, Lord, if your Bible has that, that's what it's talking about. And why does that matter? Because this is Yahweh God. This is the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And he said, who should I say is sending me to, 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 the, to the Jewish people? And he says, I am. That's Yahweh. I am that I am. And so it talks about him in two phases. It talks about him from the standpoint that he has always been. He always will be. He was not created by anything, but he created everything, all powerful, almighty, all knowing and all places at all times. Yahweh God. But it's more than that, because God, Yahweh also speaks to the fact of his covenant. He had a covenant with the Israelites. That's what they did on the on Mount Sinai, if you'll recall. They came down with the Ten Commandments and then all that came behind that. But that actually goes back further than that. It goes literally all the way back to a man named Abram, who became Abraham. And within that, we had the Abrahamic covenant that God would bless the the Israelites, the Jewish people, through Abraham. You say, so what? I'm not Jewish. I don't even know any Jewish people. And some people don't. God has a covenant with us, too, who are his followers who are the believers in Jesus Christ. You say, do they really? Yeah, and you know, it's it's always cracked me up because this stuff is thousands of years old, but it's called the New Covenant. The New Covenant. If you got your Bibles, look at Jeremiah 31. Again, this is kind of reruns, but it doesn't hurt to rerun it. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33 says this, or 34 says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. That's what I was just talking about. In the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, 
though I was a husband to them. That's the relationship God had with Israel. He considered a marriage with these people. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This covenant came into effect with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ this covenant was sealed in the blood of jesus because you say well wait that's all about israel no those of us who believe in jesus christ have been grafted in this is about a covenant of belief surrender to jesus christ and so you and i who are here today that know jesus christ as our savior and lord are literally in a covenantal relationship with yahweh god the god of the universe through jesus christ his son all right so when we see L-O-R-D on all caps, that's speaking to the relationship we have with God Almighty, Yahweh God. You guys got that? So when we give thanks, we're giving thanks to one who we have a closer relationship with through his spirit than anyone we could ever have on this earth. You guys tracking with me on that? All right. So knowing that, why do we give him thanks? And here we are. We see it. it, it he, he gives us two answers in this psalm. First off, for he's good. God is good. How many of you guys touch your kids and your grandkids? God is great. God is good. And we thank him for this food. You guys remember that one? Yeah. It's good theology. <laughs> God is great. And God is good. You know, in the Hebrew, and I'm not going to get real pointy-headed today. I, I was afraid I might, but the Lord showing you guys mercy about this today. The word good, which in the Hebrew is the word tov, that in five bucks will get you a coffee, is one of the more flexible words in Hebrew. And guys, Hebrew is one of those languages where everything's context. You can take any given, like a, a word, depending on what's in front of back of it, it can change its meaning quite a bit. But I discovered this because I just wanted to make sure I was on the same page. The word good in English is a pretty purposeful word as well. I went on dictionary.com the other day and looked, and there are 49 definitions for the word good. And I'm going to read those to you now. No, nah, I'm just kidding. No, no. You people, don't, don't let me get away with stuff, really. But here's what I want you to, uh, here's what I want you to really d d d glean from this word good. good. Good can be qualitative, right? You did good. Good can also be ethical. He was a good person, right? And I'm not talking about the way the world does that, right? Well, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. <clears throat> Failure. That's not true. There's only one good, correct? Good can mean excellent. It can mean valuable. It can mean beneficial, if you will. Think of the creation. Every time, every day, as God was making the world, what did it say at the end of after he created the thing? And it was good. And it was good. Folks, at the end of six days, it was a perfect world. Sin sullied that fairly quickly. But there was a point. And you know, when I think about this, and this is not in my notes, but I'm just going to kind of kind of go off for just a second. Is this not beautiful? Folks, we have got such a sin-tainted world today. We have no idea how beautiful God's creation was before sin. We're going to see it again. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But as beautiful as this is, this pales in comparison to what God said was good when he created it. Again, there's an ethical aspect to good as well. It can speak of being morally upright or being an ethical person. And both come into play when we're talking about Yahweh. Because, I hope you believe this because it's true, God is perfect. Think about that. Do you praise God? When you pray, 
I usually, I, I kind of my prayers become this. When I start my prayers in the morning with the Lord, I, I kind of report for duty, thank Him for another night of good rest and another day to serve Him. And then I pause and I praise Him for something. And kind of the way He and I have got this working right now is every day it's a different kind of thing to praise. And I, I try to be specific. I praise Him for His Word. I praise Him for His church. I praise Him for His mercy. I praise Him for His creation. I praise Him for the intelligence that He gave us. You know, just, just to really kind of drill down on that and think about why am I praising You today, Lord? And not thanking, but really praising Him for that because He created all those things. But I'm staggered over and over again by the fact that God is perfect. God, never, God has never made a mistake. You guys know that? Ever? Ever? Made a mistake. You say, you don't know my neighbor. They started out good. I don't know what they did with it. I get that. And he blesses us in so many different ways. He, he's, he's also, though, he's holy. And not only is he perfect, he's without sin. Which is something else we need to always keep in our minds. I'm going to pause right here. You guys are going fast. Pastor Bruce, you are so basic today. I'm falling asleep. Guys, focus in with me here. Focus in with me on this because it's so easy in the Christian life as we get older and kind of move along to just go, yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, I got it. And I think when we do that, we have lost the literal wonder of who our God is, of who our God is. So stay with me on this. Have you noticed that the world's gods, whether you've read Greek or Roman mythology or even some of the other mythologies from around the world. Have you noticed that those gods, little G gods, are all about themselves? They're arbitrary. If you don't like what they're doing, they'll just, poof, you're gone. Right? Christy and I were just in Italy and we got to see all the statues of all those arbitrary gods. They were a mess. I mean, they make, they make the stories that come on TV and there's not many of those left, the soap operas. They make those people look absolutely honorable and good compared to the mess that they do and if they don't if they see something they want they just take it whether it belongs to them or not it's all about themselves and is not the world reflecting that today not so with god perfect holy without sin that's why we can praise him that's why we can thank him god we serve a good god I don't have it in my notes here, but I, I, I know this verse kind of hangs in my mind all the time. You guys have heard it probably to where you can quote it. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Anything good you have in your life, anything good, anything good in your life is because of God. You say, well, I, I work for what I've got. How do you think you had the muscles? How do you think you had the mind? How do you think you had the endurance? How do you think you had the opportunity? Where did that come from? It came from God. I think if we start praising God on a more granular level, there's going to be a lot more joy in our lives, quite frankly. Because, you know, we, we kind of get sometimes where it's like, well, if you miss getting hit by a car, you're like, oh, thank you, God. You know, but again, thank you, God, I'm breathing today. Right? That's where we need to get to because that is from God. There's a second reason we can give him thanks and why we should based on this verse of Scripture. And that is, and a lot of our Christian faith, by the way, falls under this umbrella. His mercy endures forever. Mercy. If you've got another translation, you might have the word loving kindness. Anybody got that in their translation? Loving kindness, anybody? You guys aren't even looking. It's all good. You got it? Loving kindness. NASB has loving kindness. That's valid. We're going to talk about that in a minute. This word mercy is a translation. Well, let me ask you this. Who knows a Jewish word other than tov, which I just told you means good? Anybody know a, Jew, a, Jew, a Hebrew word? What do you know? Shalom. Shalom, right? That's going to be the answer for most Westerners today. Anybody else know another one? Mazel tov. <laughs> we'll stop at that. <laughs> yeah, I think think of you if you if if I mean if it was a case where your life depended on it and somebody said name a Hebrew word, you'd say shalom, 
right? Peace. I want to give you, I think, what's maybe one of the most important words in the, New, in the Old Testament. It's in there 249 times. That is by, by no means in the top 20, and I'm taking out you know, prepositions and things like that and articles. But it, it's, it's, it's pretty high, but it's not nearly as high as a lot of other words. But it's in there 249 times. This word mercy is a translation of a Hebrew word chesed, which that you got that in the back of your throat, got chesed, which if you want to spell it, C-H-E-S-E-D, and a little, little carrot over both E's. Chesed. I, 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 I was reminded by the Lord that I had to write a paper on Hesed when I was in seminary back in 2007. And so I've got that here and I'm going to read that paper to you now. It's only seven pages long. You guys ready for that? Yeah, if you want it, let me know. I'll send it to you. But it is not exactly what I call a page turner. So for what it's worth. But that word is vitally important and we should know it. I mean, 249 times, guys, you think that kind of matters to people? Now, some of those times it's used of man to man, right? Mercy, show me mercy. But more often than not, it shows up as man, God to man. And by the way, about half of the instances of this word are in the Psalms. Okay, so there's a praise element to that. We're praising God for his chesed. Now, mercy can go a couple of different ways. Probably a lot of you think of mercy as opposed to grace, right? Grace and mercy. All right, two sides of the same coin. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, right? You've done something and someone says, well, I'm not going to give you that that you deserve, that punishment that you deserve. While grace is receiving something that you don't deserve. All right. But. Do you guys realize that we would not be able to experience God's grace, amazing grace, the grace of Jesus dying for us if God was not merciful? Because in order to experience the grace, you've got to experience the mercy that He didn't just pound you, smite you because of your sin. He, he foregoes. There's, there's this word we've seen a lot over the last two or three years in relation to landlords and tenants and rents and those sorts of things. It's the word forbearance. You guys heard that word, right? Forbearance. It's like, we're not going to, we're not going to evict you. Even though we could, we're not because we understand the circumstance that you are in currently. That's forbearance. That's mercy in a very real sense. And God is forbearing. God would desire that none would perish, right? We know that from the New Testament. And so, but you think about it, We sing Amazing Grace and all those great songs about grace. We don't sing a lot of mercy songs, do we? We really don't. Because I don't think we as humans want to think about what we deserve. We'd really rather think about what's God going to give me. Am I the only one guilty of that? I mean, this is the time of year where we kind of confuse God with a guy in a red suit sometimes, right? He knows when you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. That's not the dude in the red suit. That's our Lord, right? So I, I think we, we, we tend to we tend to want to focus on grace because mercy means that we have done something deserving of punishment. It's a tension that we kind of get to get our arms around because on the one side, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ here, you're a sinner saved by grace, right? You're a sinner saved by grace. Yes, you are. Whether you like that or not, that's true. But at the same time, we're a royal priesthood. We're God's own special people. We're both of those things. In the very same way that mercy and grace work together to save us. So we need to kind of recognize that reality. Because you see, this idea of mercy can also mean compassion. And here's a word we don't like either. Pity. Pity. We don't see that word in the Bible a whole lot. Paul talks about it in in 1 Corinthians 15 when he talks about resurrection from the dead. He said, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then this is all, and I'm paraphrasing greatly, then this is all a big waste of time and we're the most pitiable of all men because we're chasing after something that's not true. But then he says, but Christ is risen from the dead. And so all of that falls in behind that. That's exciting. I hope you're excited by that. 
But I want you to think about this compassion idea for just a minute because what compassion really is about when someone who has means and opportunity helps someone that has neither. Would you agree with that? They've got means. In other words, they've got some resource. And they've got opportunity, which means they have the time and the energy to give to someone who has neither. Folks, that's salvation. That's salvation. Apart from the work of God in our lives, we'd all be destined for Satan's hell. And if you're here this morning, you've never accepted Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord. I will tell you, you do not have the means to please God. Nothing you'll ever do in this world will please a holy and righteous God. Because even your very best is filth compared to his goodness. Opportunity wise, you could live for a thousand lifetimes and you're never going to get there. God has the means through his son, Jesus Christ. He died on the cross and rose again three days later. And that is the avenue and entry into his kingdom. That if you will confess to him the sin that he died on the cross for, ask him to forgive you for that and then proclaim him as your savior and your lord believe that he died and rose again the third day then you can have that salvation okay so if you've never done that here before today we don't have like a formal invitation or anything like that but if you're sitting here today and you know that you know that you never had a point in your life when you asked jesus to forgive you for your sin and ask him to become the lord and leader of your life you need to do that today catch me catch Catherine or kurt at the end of the service today or catch Larry that was up here before catch one of us and let us talk with you about that. We can share some scriptures with you. Um, don't don't be banking on the idea that you're going to do just enough good in this life that when you get there and they zero it all out, that you got two good things above all the bad things. And everything else is zeroed out and you're going to get into God's heaven will not happen. That is a lie from the pit of hell. OK, so don't let the world tell you otherwise. One last thing on Hesed and then I'm going to kind of start to wind this up. Kindness. Kindness is a word that it's translated as in the New Te- in the Old Testament sometimes. And guys, that's a fruit of the Spirit. It means to be useful. It means to be helpful. God is helpful. God wants to help you in this life, right? He's not just out there telling you, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Any of you guys raised that way? God was just the no God. Am I the only one? I was raised that way. That's not my parents' fault, by the way. I think my parents didn't like it either. But, you know, it's kind of the way I was raised in the South. Just God was that pounding on you kind of God. Here's the other word, loving kindness. You mentioned it earlier. It's an NASB. Guys, that's a great word. Um, Love directs kindness. Does that make sense? God acts out of his love and being helpful and useful to us. That's the idea there. Strong's Concordance takes all of this this covenantal, covenantal aspect that I talked about, as well as this range of the word, And they put it into account and they define it as being unfailing love, loyal love. It is a great one. Devotion. You think we want to be devoted to God, but you guys realize God's devoted to us as well because of his covenant. Think about that. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's devoted to us. And that unfailing part is confirmed at the end because what does the verse say? Where was I? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Guys, we are never going to outlive God's chesed, his loving kindness, his mercy, his love, his kindness. We will never outlive that. And that is why we can be thankful. His compassion and his loving kindness are what led him to send his son to die for us in the first place. And that Hesed drives all of his interactions with us. And that's why. And folks. This is in the midst of the destruction of Jerusalem. That Jeremiah the prophet. In lamentation could write the words where we get our song. Great is thy faithfulness from. Lamentations 3, 22 through 24 says this. Though through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Hesed is both mercies and compassion in that verse. Let me read it again. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. 
Spourheads. <laughs>